All right, welcome everybody. Um, <coughs> before I introduce the speaker, I'm going to take the opportunity to do a small piece of advertising. Um, the topic of the talk today is about games that are based on quantum mechanics. Um, there will be a, an entire session about this at the next American Physical Society March meeting, um, which I'm organizing and uh, Chris will be um, talking at. Um, the, the whole area of um, making games that are relevant to uh, quantum mechanics has become, um, well, it's, it's, it's got a lot bigger in the last couple of years, and there are now sort of many, many examples of these kinds of things. And one of the things that I would like to do prior to the, this meeting is have some people review these games uh, as, as computer games. So um, if anybody is interested in writing some reviews of uh, quantum-related computer games, there's a, there's a hand, uh, then please let me know after the talk. So our speaker today is um, Chris Cantwell from USC. Um, he is the author of the game Quantum Chess. He's also um, a, a graduate student doing uh, research on quantum simulation. But today he's going to talk uh, to us about his quantum chess game. So okay. Hi. Um, as he said, I'm Chris Cantwell. Um, my, I'm in quantum computing at uh, USC. Um, I'm also pursuing a master's in computer science along with the PhD in physics. Um, I guess before I get started, I'd like to kind of know the, the makeup of the audience. How many do we have in like physics or math or science? Okay, any that are more like just computer programming related that don't have a background in any kind of quantum physics at all? Okay, so we've got a couple. All right, um, so I'm going to start by talking about the, the conception of the game and sort of the story of its development and then go into more of what the game actually is and maybe finish with um, some of the, the issues it still faces and talk about the future of quantum games. So I'll start with, uh, I guess, a story. Um, about two and a half years ago now, I was, I've, I've been a graduate student at USC for far too long. <laughs> And I was starting to kind of feel a little burned out. Um, and happenstance, I met a professor at USC, Professor Koshnavis. And he was teaching a course on creativity the following semester and talked me into um, checking it out. So this course was completely different than anything I had ever taken. Uh, we drew a lot of pictures, took a lot of pictures, had to invent little tiny things with pink erasers and stuff. And for a final project, we had to create something, and so I chose to create a game based on quantum physics. Um, so some of the, the motivation I had were um, how many of you, I, I'm sure there are many that can relate, where you start talking about what you're working on or doing with anyone in the general public and their eyes kind of glaze over and you know they're seeing just math equations like that, that top picture up there, and they just kind of tune you out because the word quantum is scary. Um, I want quantum to not be scary. Uh, a, a secondary motivation is the imagination side of things. I mean, we, we talk about stuff like superposition and entanglement and things like that, but how many of you could actually imagine yourself living in a superposition? What would the world look like? I mean, if I was here and over there at the same time, what's the world going to look like to me? I mean, you have Schrodinger's cat that is both alive and dead. What, what does that mean? How can you even comprehend something like that on a more intuitive level, not, not just the math? Um, so I figured a game would be a good way to experience these quantum phenomena hands-on, um, not just see a bunch of equations and try and comprehend it that way. So what I was shooting for is to give people a way to develop an intuitive understanding of the phenomena the same way we understand stuff like gravity. I mean, you could write pages of equations for general relativity and how a ball is going to fly in a parabola and land somewhere. 
But if you're going to go throw a ball, you don't do all of that. You just throw it. You, your brain just intuitively understands that, OK, well, the ball is going to kind of follow this arc, and it's going to land over there somewhere. Um, you've done it enough that your brain just does that automatically. So that's what I was shooting for with quantum mechanics was not a game that's going to teach quantum physics. A person's not going to be able to go and do quantum equations, but stuff like superposition might make a little more sense to them. So quick overview of some quantum phenomena. I wasn't really sure how um, general the audience would be. Um, superposition, you, know, you can have multiple states at once. And so here we have an atom that is can exist in the ground state or an excited state or both at the same time. Um, there's in uh, measurement. So when you observe the atom that is existing in superposition, it randomly determines whether, OK, you're going to find it in the ground state or are you going to find it in the excited state. And you also have entanglement where two different particles, their states are dependent on each other. So you observe one that affects how someone will observe the other one. And then interference, quantum states can be thought of as waves. And you get interfering wave patterns where they can interfere constructively or destructively. And that changes the, the amplitudes of finding them in a certain position. Um, so before I started working on quantum chess, I wanted to see what else was out there. I mean, were there other quantum games out there? and I wanted to build off of that. So there wasn't a whole lot. Um, I found quantum tic-tac-toe. And in quantum tic-tac-toe, the player places two symbols at a time. And then on what is called a cycle, the, it collapses. But the collapse in the game as it was implemented was deterministic. The player chose which of their, their markers was going to be in what position. And then the other um, markers would fall out according to that determination. Um, so it was not non-deterministic like quantum measurements should be. Um, and there's no interference. Um, I guess there's kind of entanglement. But it didn't feel like, a, I mean, a player playing it would sort of get the idea of, OK, this is sort of what superposition is. This is sort of what entanglement means, is these things kind of depend on each other. So if a marker's here, then it can't be over there. And the, the O can't be at the same place and stuff like that. But it was missing some things. Um, there was sure a, I, I understand. So if somebody plays two crosses, mm -hmm. and then you say, how decision is made, which one is erased, which one is remaining? So the, the little GIF here kind of shows it. So the player places two crosses. The opponent places two O's. And then the first player again places two crosses. And now there's a conflict. It can't, and you have to de decide the conflict. So the player that placed the two crosses, I believe, in the rules of this game, gets to pick one of them in one of the spaces. Of his own? Of his cross. own piece, okay. yes. And so then that determines, OK, well, the other cross definitely isn't over here. So that one must be the O. And then so it all kind of follows the chain of dependency. When the players place their respective symbols, do they know about the previous uh, move? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, this is an image of what the game actually looks like. So you can see the x's are placed, the o's are placed, these x's are placed, and then one of them is chosen, and that was the, the result. So, but again, it's deterministic. There's no random fallout of measurements and stuff like that. Um, there was also another quantum chess I found, um, Dr. Salim Ackel. Um, it's, it's called quantum chess, but it's the, the pieces start the game in a superposition of being multiple types of pieces. And then as soon as you select it, it's measured so it determines what it is and how it can move. So it's really just random pieces. It randomizes the game of chess. You don't really get the feel of superposition. And there's no entanglement, no inf interference or anything like that. So there's definitely a, a gap to be filled there. Um, and then there's the what I consider up to that point, probably the, 
the most, um, the, the best example, I guess, the QCraft mod for Minecraft. They added a, a special type of box that could exist in superposition and could be entangled with other boxes, but there's, there's still no interference. Um, and it's very limited. I mean, you're not actually building on a superposition that is underlying in the, in the code of the game. Um, entanglement is, I mean, it's just kind of dependency and, but they did do a good job of, I mean, the, the player can interact with something that actually kind of feels like superposition. It kind of feels like entanglement and they do get a sense for observational dependency. Like you can look at something from one angle and then move and go and look at it from a different one and it'd be complete, it would look completely different. Um, so you get sort of the feel for measurement and stuff like that. But one of the things I noticed all of these games doing is they're kind of picking and choosing, taking certain aspects of quantum mechanics and plugging them into an existing game in a way that would sort of give you the sense for what it was like, but left out other parts. They didn't actually build the game from the ground up to be quantum. Um, so I wanted to build a game from the ground up to be quantum. So I actually wanted to make essentially a quantum simulation and then build the rules of a game on top of that. Um, so I had some design goals and I forget, yes. So some of my design goals. The game would include superposition, entanglement and interference, but in a way that the player could actually use them towards some sort of winning strategy. Um, all of these other games, you, you couldn't really do that. Uh, it would be non-deterministic. So you, you couldn't plan for how a measurement was gonna play out. You had to strategize as to how the probabilities could play out. Um, I didn't want to just inject quantum phenomena into the game, as, as I said. I didn't want to pick and choose, okay, well, I'm going to make a piece that exists in superposition, and so knights can exist in superposition or something like that. I wanted, to, wanted it to be kind of quantum at its core, like a quantum simulation. Um, I didn't want it to teach quantum mechanics. I, I feel like there's a lot of games out there that are built to be educational. And I feel like a lot of them sort of miss a mark in the fun aspect. I mean, educational games, a lot of, a lot of times, students will look at it and go, okay, it's just an educational game. I don't really want to play that. I wanted to make it a fun game that wasn't meant to teach quantum mechanics, but that as a side effect of playing it, you might sort of gain an intuitive understanding of how quantum mechanics works. I mean, sort of like baseball. It's not meant to teach gravity. It's not meant to teach how a ball is going to fly. But in playing the game, you're going to learn that, okay, well, if I throw the ball this hard, it, I have to throw it at this angle for it to reach that spot over there. Um, you sort of gain that intuitive feel just by playing it because it's a fun game. So these were some of the design goals. Um, so I settled on movement. It's one of the most core aspects of any board game is how pieces move. Chess, checkers, I mean, you can name a, a thousand games where the basic thing you want to do is move pieces around on a grid. And I decided that if I made the movement of the game quantum and essentially a unitary that acted on a superposition, then I, my, my hope was that all of these other goals would sort of play out. You would get superposition, you would get entanglement just because movement was quantum. You would get interference just because movement was quantum. Um, if the game was fun enough, then people would start to strategize based on their quantum movement and that would require sort of an intuitive understanding of how the, the quantum stuff worked, how the unitary movement worked. Um, and so, you can think of movement on a grid as swapping the value of a position. Um, so if you have, say, a knight in a position and you want to move him to an empty spot, well, all you're doing is swapping empty with where the knight is. Um, and you can create a unitary swap matrix, and you can create the square root of that swap matrix, which will give you superposition. 
So if you perform the square root of the swap, it's like saying, well, now there are two subspaces, one in which the knight did move and one in which it didn't. So I decided to implement a game where you use the square root of the swap to move around a board. And that was my first prototype, and this was the result of that class. Um, my final project, I threw it together in a month, and it was played on a five by five board. Um, the pieces, each player could move a single piece using a single quantum move, and it used the square root of the swap for the movement. There were rules for capture and um, measurement. The player could also measure pieces, if I recall correctly. It's been quite a while since I've messed with this prototype. Um, but takes are not swaps. Takes are not swaps, yes. Um, so, so capture was a little, little trickier. You, you can't actually. That's not unitary. Yes. <laughs> so, so the way you, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment, actually. <laughs> um, in this game, a capture consisted of first performing a measurement on the piece that was trying to capture, and then if it was actually there, removing the piece from the space it was moving into and then moving the piece in. Um, but I'll get to unitary capture in, in just a moment. Um, but anyway, it worked. It was a month-long project. It was a game that was built on an actual superposition. I mean, actual being meaning the, the underlying code tracked the entire superposition. Uh, movement was unitary, aside from capture. Um, and it, it sort of illustrated some of the concepts I wanted to, it to illustrate. So when you say square root of a swap, yes. what you mean by this, let's find the matrix square of which gives us swap, and mm -hmm. somehow you sample the space of all those matrices randomly? I mean, they're all related by a phase. It's but how do you choose which one square root is? It, it's, it doesn't really matter. The, the goal of it was to use a matrix that squared would give you a swap, that, so that if you pour, performed the same unitary twice, you get a full swap into the space. Um, but if you only do it once, you get superposition where you have some subspace that hasn't done anything and some subspace that has. So this UQM is a square root of the swap matrix. Um, it's the square root up to a, a global phase of, I believe, minus i. Um, but it's global phase, so you can just throw that away. You can reformat the matrix to, to look different, but it's still going to perform the same basic function on the game. But in order to get the difference between the different branches of square root here, you would have to limit the type of matrices that you square. Certainly this is not true. You take any matrix, four by four matrix, many of them will give you this W upon square. Yeah. How do you choose besides the face? That's what I mean. To understand. Is there some other condition? There's in, there's in quantum computing, the square root of the swap matrix is, is used for quantum computations. I just mm -hmm. grabbed one. Yeah, just choose, you choose a yeah, yeah, just, yeah, you just pick one. It doesn't, it's, my, my only goal was that it created superposition. So you, you pick one of them that does that. Um, this is the one I picked actually. I think the one I'm using right now is just this up to a global phase, but it's, it's essentially the same thing, so. Um, so, quick behind the scenes. If you do a quantum move of the, the blue piece down one on a board that hasn't done anything, you, you're you end up with two possible boards with some complex amplitude associated with them. This is sort of what a, a superposition of the two could be represented as. Um, Why did you choose five by five? Random? Yeah, random. It was small enough that I, I could implement it without the uh, Hilbert space growing crazy. Um, I actually had to implement um, sort of an artificial means of keeping it under control so it wouldn't 
explodes. That's the, the pulsing meter you see around the outside. I decided that there would be spontaneous collapse in this proto prototype. So once the superposition got to a certain size, if you did another quantum move, it would measure the entire board and it would all collapse to a definite state just so you could handle it in memory. Um, I've since gotten beyond that and I'll talk about that in a moment too. But for, for the prototype, I decided five by five was large enough to be interesting, but small enough to be comprehensible <laughs> to a player. Um, so capture, as I said, in this prototype was the position trying to capture the piece would be measured. So it would be determined, okay, is it there or not? And then on the subspace where the piece that it was trying to capture is there, it just threw it away. Not unitary, I had to kind of cut a corner there for the prototype, but there is on paper a way you can implement unitary capture on a board if you create a capture subspace. And what that involves is you first swap the piece out into that subspace. It'll never be seen again because as long as you tune the rules so that you can't swap it back in. And so you're just sort of constantly expanding this capture subspace and moving pieces out of the, the board space that you're interested into it if you're trying to capture them. Does it mean you have to include enter capture? Something going back on the board? Not, it, if you don't allow that rule, then no. <laughs> Um, and so you, you can kind of fudge it by saying, well, there's, there's no unitary that lets you go the other way, so we can just throw it out. Um, you could, question? Assume that a, the queen and pawn will swap in the interest of squared? Huh? I assume that a queen and pawn will swap in just the square if you use the pawn from the last row of chess? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, so you'd have to. I suppose you always have an extra queen. So yes, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> So you can do all of the non-unitary things in the game. You, you can do it in a unitary way by just adding Ancilla spaces. Um, but in, as long as the rules of the game don't allow those Ancilla spaces to, the unitaries to act backwards, then you don't actually have to code that in. You can just throw it out. <laughs> um, so it, it's kind of a hand wavy fudge, but it, it does work on paper. <laughs> Um, so I actually don't have my notes, so let me read this really quick. Every interaction moves a piece from the subspace where it was present. Okay, yeah, I already talked about that. So this was my prototype. Um, like I said, it was interesting, I thought. It was quantum, wasn't particularly fun, but it accomplished the goal of the, the course. Um, Did you prove for this prototype or for more complicated ones whether the game will always end in a win or draw? Is there a no, I have, I have yet to prove that for any of, my <laughs> any of the variants yet. Um, yeah, I don't know yet. There, there's actually in quantum chess some concern that a game could go on forever. Um, I, I don't know yet whether it's true. There hasn't been enough play testing. Um, one of the challenges I faced with this game was physical memory size. I mean, even on a small five by five board, you, combinatorics tells you there's 800 million possible combinations. Um, so if you have to store a complex float for that many combinations, you're looking at almost 53 gigabytes of memory to store the entire possible state. Obviously, you can't do that. So what I ended up doing was storing a, a map of basis states, which are board configurations, to their complex amplitudes, and only the ones that had non-zero amplitudes. Um, and then I had the spontaneous collapse to keep it under control. And spontaneous collapse was not fun at all. <laughs> People, I mean, you'd, you'd be quantum moving your, your pieces around the board and then the whole board is filled with pieces in superposition and then all of a sudden everything is decided and it's just random and you have no clue what happened. Um, but like I said, it worked for the prototype. So fast forward about a year and a half. Um, 
well, right after the prototype, I presented it to my research advisor and group, and Todd Brune is my advisor. He said, hey, it's interesting. I know a guy at Caltech who might be interested in this, Spiros, and I always pronounce his last name wrong, Mikalakis. Um, he worked on the QCraft mod for Minecraft with Google. Um, so about a week later, I met with him and showed him my prototype and he fell in love with it and I started meeting with him weekly for about a year to iterate on it and try and turn it into a fun game. So some of the first steps were trying to figure out how to keep the superposition under control without the spontaneous collapse or to make the spontaneous collapse a little less jarring so it's not collapsing the entire board but it's just measuring a single space to kind of bring to throw away some of the subspaces, but not everything. Um, trying to implement uh, different piece types, different rules and such. And at one point, I decided on a measurement rule. Um, and that was sort of the turning point for the game. Up until that point, I was very worried about the size of the superposition and things growing out of control. Um, and just the physical ability for the computer to handle a game. I mean, my, my dream goal when I first started the project was I'm gonna make truly quantum chess. And then, well, even a five by five board with what amounts to be Qtrits, I mean, zero, one, or two, you, you get 52 gigs of memory to store the superposition. Now try, try to do that with chess where you have all of the different piece types and it's an eight by eight board. It's impossible. Um, so I, I hit on a measurement rule, um, which has been dubbed the no double occupancy rule, but I've generalized it to, the, to be the K occupancy rule. And I'm actually um, writing about it in one of, I'm, I'm writing up a paper on quantum chess, and so I discussed this. But basically, there, there's some master or oracle or whatever that's tracking the state of the board and the probabilities and stuff. And, Anytime a position has some non-zero probability of being occupied by more than one type of piece, it performs a measurement to determine if one or the other is there or not. It throws away the subspace where it is there if it finds that it's not, or vice versa. Um, after that, I started adding different piece types for small chess variations, so like I had a, a four by five variant and stuff like that. And in playing them with this measurement rule, I found that the superposition wasn't even getting close to being out of control. Um, at that time, I had this measurement rule and I still had a spontaneous collapse mechanic that would make sure it didn't, but I wasn't even getting close. I mean, I was able to bump the, the collapse size up to whatever I wanted and the game was still under control. It was still simulation, still simulation friendly. And so I decided to try fully eight by eight board full quantum chess again. And it seems that this rule keeps it under control enough that the, the simulation can, can handle it. In theory, if a player was trying to break the game, I think it's possible, but in practice, you're probably going to have some sort of interaction that leads to a position being occupied by more than one type of piece, and so the game will collapse it back down to at most one type of piece. Um, it won't fully collapse the superposition. In fact, after the measurement, you can still have a piece in that position in superposition if it measured the other piece. Because there's a chance that, well, okay, this piece has some probability of being there, the subspace that it's thrown away, well, maybe that piece still isn't definitely there. Um, it, it seems to work out well. Um, so between that measurement rule and a player's desire to play strategically and win, so you're actually going to be trying to take pieces sometimes or do things to purposely collapse their position because they're, the fact that they're in superposition is a little annoying to you, it, it stays under control. Um, I, I have an idea for limiting it if necessary, but I haven't implemented it yet. So if a piece 
maybe only has a 10% probability of being in a position. I can disallow quantum movements from it, so it, it can't create more, but anyway. Do you believe it's possible to play statistical in this game? It absolutely is, and it's actually quite fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, anyway, through about a year and a half of iteration, it came around and became fully quantum chess with some rule variants. Um, so then Caltech Spiros put on this, they, they had an event and they created a video where Stephen Hawking is playing quantum chess against Paul Rudd, narrated by Keanu Reeves. So I wanted to play a little blurb here where Keanu Reeves is explaining quantum chess. I hope we have sound. Oh, that's actually, I thought I had the link to the right point, but it's right around 4.30. Oh. Okay, this'll work. Okay. Is the volume on here? Or can I do it from? Here, let me, my computer is at max, so. Is there, or is, Oh, if we can't, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll talk in place of Keanu Reeves, even though I think he sounds better than me. <laughs> That's at max. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk over Keanu then. So anyway. Here's, this was the first version of quantum chess that was actually what I wanted quantum chess to be. Um, so you can move pieces like normal, or you can do a quantum move. And what a quantum move was, was up to two standard moves away. And I decided to do up to two standard moves away because it was essentially there's a chance you're not doing anything. So to counteract that, well, there's a chance that you actually performed two moves in one turn. I figured that was pretty fair. And being the, the square root of a swap, it's designed such that if you do the same move twice, you're accomplishing the same amount of work as two standard moves. So very arbitrary, but it seems to work out well. So these are some of the two move paths that this queen could take. Um, in this case, he goes there. And so after the move, oops, here, we'll go forward a little bit. So after the move, you have a queen that exists in superposition. There is a 50% probability that it's still in D1, a 50% probability that it has successfully moved two moves up to B3. Um, on the back end coding side of things, it's actually a complex amplitude, one over root two, and there's a phase associated with the move, but this is what the player is presented with is the probability that you'll find it in that position on a measurement. So now, the black player can perform a move that will force a measurement. And it's a little hard to see, um, just because of the measurement happens so quickly, it's instantaneous. What I actually want to do now is change it so that you see the probabilities shift and then the measurement happens. But the black player performed a move of the bishop from c8 through e6 down to the queen's position of b3. Now, because it was a quantum move, there's a chance that either the queen is going to be found there or not. There's a chance that the bishop did move or not. And for quantum chess, there's no quantum capture. You can only quantum move. So that move wouldn't actually try to capture the queen. 
arbitrary rule. I used to have quantum capture implemented and I found it was way too powerful. There were combinations of moves where you could end the game in two moves with 25% probability and there's nothing your opponent could do about it. So you say there are captures, but they're completely deterministic. Is that what you're saying? You cannot capture using a quantum move. You can capture using a standard move. It will capture that piece on the subspace where that piece exists there. On the subspace where the piece isn't there, it just moves in. No. Well, it, it depends. So if the piece you're capturing with is, exists on all subspaces, then in every instance, the piece that you're capturing is no longer in that position, so there's no probability that you'll have two pieces in that position, so no measurement occurs. Don't you have a problem with checks? So we'll get to that in just a moment. <laughs> because if one of yes. the positions is threatening the king, the yeah. king has to move, but if it's a superposition, that's not a lot. Yeah. But also another comment is, I'm surprised that with all this randomness that uh, each move has, you did not implement, did not implement something like Fisher Random the initial configuration, why? Just didn't. <laughs> it's completely doable, um, but. Well, it's the easiest part. Right? Yeah, it's random. <laughs> So what you see on the board is their actual probabilities. Um, so after the queen moves, there's no probability that the queen is in D3. It's, you're performing the full two moves in one turn. So there is a 50% chance that the queen is in D1 a 50% chance that the queen is in b3. And again, on the actual back end side of things, it's complex amplitudes, but you get the magnitudes and its probability is shown. Um, so let me get through this. For instance, when you do pawn on passant, there could be problems. Or with Kastlin, with Kastlin you might have problems, because sometimes Kastlin is not allowed if the point so, is right? Yeah. Um, it was interesting. <laughs> Let me get a little further and we'll go into some of the more interesting stuff, I think. Um, so anyway, the bishop move forced a measurement. What happened was it measured the queen to see if it was in b3. It found that it was, which means the bishop isn't there. So we're in the subspace where the move didn't actually do anything. So it collapses from actually four possible boards after the bishop move to one. The move did collapse the queen. Huh? The move did the yeah, it collapsed the queen and it collapsed the bishop, but you didn't really see it because it did it instantly. So my question is if the bishop had measured the queen and the queen was still back in D1, that means the bishop is now in D3, right? So if the measurement was on the queen, and it's saying, OK, is the queen in b3? And it finds that it's not. That doesn't necessarily mean the bishop is. Okay. So I was wondering, I, I was wondering that if the yeah. bishop It would alter the probability of the bishop being there because, well, I'm not sure. I don't know. Even I get confused by it. But sometimes, um, sometimes the collapse doesn't lead to a piece being fully in a space, but it will shift the probability to be more likely that it's there because in some of the subspaces where it is there, it's, that could lead to the other piece not being there. I don't know. 
it gets very confusing. Um, this didn't. OK, I'm trying to. Huh? Oh, click off the video. OK. There we go. Um, OK, so the rules of quantum chess. We already went over the, the quantum move and the standard move. Only power pieces can perform quantum moves. Pawns cannot quantum move. Again, arbitrary. I decided that a pawn being able to do up to two standard moves in one turn would be a little too powerful. You've got a lot of them, and if you could go forward two and then capture something, that it might lead to some, I don't know, a little too much power. And it turns out they work well as still as a wall, sort of their standard function in chess, um, because you can't quantum move two moves somewhere if the middle spot is blocked 100% by a piece. So if a pawn is 100% in the way of a bishop trying to do two moves, well, then that's not a valid move. Um, capturing is not allowed during a quantum move. There is no check or checkmate. The, the point that you brought up is, well, Maybe the piece is there, maybe it's not. Maybe the king is there, maybe it's not, because you can have kings in superposition. Um, so the rule for winning the game is 100% king kill. So there, there's no king left on the board for the player. If a piece, so I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> No. But if a piece can be blocked by Knights can make quantum moves. So wouldn't that make them actually really, 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 really good? Knights are really, really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you are chess players? Cool. <laughs> this has actually um, gotten quite a decent chess following. Um, so anyway, yeah, no checkmate, no check which means there's no blocking of castling through check and stuff like that. I'll get to special rules. I actually didn't get to creating a slide for special rules like Ampasant and, and castling, but they are implemented in the game. Um, and if you guys want, we can do like a little demo game and I can show you some of the stuff. Um, but these are the basic rules. The quantum move, again, essentially up to two standard moves. Um, you can think of it in terms of a quantum circuit as a controlled unitary on the values of the positions of two spaces where the controls are the positions in the path on the way to that space. So if, if a position is blocked, then on that basis state, the unitary has no effect, it's identity. Otherwise, it's performing the unitary, which is either swap for a standard move or the square root swap for the quantum move. A um, little bit of representation and notation. We have board configurations are the basis states. Um, so a basis state is all of the different piece values for the different positions on a board. So the board starts in the state where you have white rook, white knight, white bishop, white queen, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the superposition, the state of the board is a complex amplitude times the uh, board configuration, essentially, the basis states. So another thing that we should go over, because I, I do have some analysis of different moves, is quantum chess algebraic notation. This has been a, uh, a joint venture um, with some of the quantum chess fans that got actually a pretty interesting discussion. We modified standard chess algebraic notation by adding a couple of new symbols. The little hat symbol signifies a quantum move being performed, and measurements and their outcomes are in parentheses. So in the first picture there, you have a quantum move of the knight. The notation for that is ng1 hat e5. So it shows that it did a quantum move from g1 to e5. Um, in the second picture, you have player two trying to perform a quantum move um, from b8 to e5, where player one's knight is. It will force a measurement because there's some probability that either piece will be there. And so you have the quantum move nb8 to e5 and 
a measurement of the black knight in E5 and it's found not to be there. And so you can actually see in the image, I hope if it's big enough, that the probability of the white knight being in E5 has increased um, after measurement and renormalization. There's a better chance that E5 is there because one of the reasons the black knight couldn't move there is that the white knight was there in the way. So it just means it's more likely that we're in a subspace where the white knight is there. Um, again, no quantum capture, so the white knight being there does prevent the black knight's move from doing anything. Um, two quantum moves to the same space, you get a, a phase interference and you find that the knight is fully in E5. Um, destructive interference back in G1 means it's not there, so um, probabilities are renormalized again and all that. Uh, analysis of quantum moves from the video. So, the first move was, well, we'll ignore the pawn moves. First move was queen quantum from D1 to D3. We'll restrict ourselves to the C8, D1, D3 subspace, so you can see that the starting state of um, bishop in C8, queen in D1, nothing in D3, after the first queen's quantum move goes to a superposition with a phase on the moved queen. Um, the second move was bishop trying to quantum move to uh, B, what was it again? Yeah, D3. Actually, that looks wrong. Did I get the letters wrong? I might have gotten the letters. Yeah, it's B, not D. Um, so D1 and B3, it should be. Anyway, you get another quantum move. You, you have, um, in the case that the queen isn't there, the move is, is successful. So you have a superposition of the bishop having moved or not moved. In the case that it isn't there, or that it is there, it blocks the move completely, so it's just identity on that basis state. Um, so you have some probability of b3 having a queen or a bishop. A measurement occurs on the queen, finds the queen is there, probabilities are renormalized, um, and you, you end up with the, the state you see. Uh, about yes? No, we'll actually have a slide for that. <laughs> um, entanglement. So, if a piece is in superposition, you can try and move through it because on some subspace it's not there blocking. So right here, the pawn is able to make the move through the knight and you end up with a pawn that is in superposition even though it's a standard move because on the subspace where the knight is in the way, it has no effect. So that's one way to get pawns into superposition. But it also means the pawn and the knight, if you think of them as separate pieces and don't think of the entire board configuration, they're entangled. Any measurement on one will affect the other one. So the mathematical analysis of the two moves the measurement outcomes, so if black then tries to move the queen to that position, there's two possible outcomes. One of them, the queen is found to be in F4, and so that collapses the knight to be in F3 because the pawn is not in F4, which means the knight was there in the way. Um, the other one is the other way around. Um, it, increases the probability that the pawn is there because it's more likely that it is. If the queen isn't, it might have blocked the queen's move, which means it's less likely that the, that the knight was in the way blocking the pawn. So you get to see entanglement in the game and interact with it. Is there ever a chance that you cannot resolve? Ever a chance to not resolve? To resolve the situation in which piece one of the two choices for each you have to choose. Is there a situation like this ever? So there's a 50-50 chance for this move and then 50-50 for that one. And then you say you measure, you mm -hmm. result based on 
Is it possible there is a conflict error? After the measurement? No, no, that you cannot perform the measurement. That you cannot so perform the measurement? I don't think so. so. Good, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just a probabilistic outcome of whether the piece you're looking at is there or not. Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm thinking about specifically related to chess. There could be situations maybe close enough, maybe when there's a checkmate or something, but there's no checkmate. There's no check or checkmate. No checkmates. That may be exactly the reason why you don't want to have checkmates. Is that? I don't even think that would matter, though. Okay. I mean, I, I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't be able to look and say, OK, is the queen there or not? Because it either is or it isn't. And if it isn't, you throw away the subspace where it was. If it is, you throw away the subspace where it wasn't. So the superposition pawn is the last pawn. You have a pawn in superposition with a queen. And you can think of them as separate pieces if you want, and they're entangled. So. If you find a measurement where you're in the subspace that it's upon, the queen disappears. So. You can move it just like a queen. Yeah. Um, you can perform standard moves on pieces that exist in superposition. And on the subspace where it is there, it successfully performs the move. On the subspace where it's not, you've done nothing. So you say you can promote a piece and then move with that piece mm -hmm. as a quantum move? Yeah. Queens can quantum move. So it is now a queen, so the rules for quantum moves apply to it. Um, some of the challenges I face still, phase representation. Phase is important in this game. It's going to determine if you perform quantum moves of like pieces. Oh, yeah. All like pieces are indistinguishable, so you can actually interfere with your two separate knights. Um, one interferes with the other, and you get probabilities that play out through interference. Um, so phases are important. Um, and you can actually flip the phase of something by performing a standard move on it. And then if you do the same quantum move again, it, you, you end up with a piece that's where you were starting from instead of where you're going, or something like that. Trying to display phase in a meaningful way in this game is pretty difficult. Here is, in my first prototype, I tried to display the phases between the pieces and using lines that were colored, and it turned into spaghetti. And you can see that it just becomes meaningless. Uh, one idea I have for showing meaningful phases is not to show any phases until you select a piece, and then to only show the relative phases that matter. So if you select a knight, you only care about the phases on light-colored knights. So you would show the relative phases of all light-colored knights compared to the knight in the position you selected. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. AI. AI for chess is hard. AI for quantum chess is extremely hard. Um, the game actually does have an AI in it at the moment. It is a stupid AI. <laughs> um, the problem is, well, one, how do you represent a superposition state in a min-max tree search where a node is a superposition instead of a defined state? Um, one idea was to just search over all possible board configurations in the current state. Well, then you have a branching factor that is insanely huge. Um, huh? Technically, that's no different than min-max. It's just the state space. Yeah. So if you're searching for, but you also have to consider that some moves will have interference and stuff like that. And that complicates things. And measurement complicates things tremendously because you cannot determine the post-measurement state a priori. So an AI searching down a tree will hit a node where a measurement will occur, and now it's got two separate universes to explore. So it has an AI. The search depth for the current AI is two. <laughs> so it performs the same starting move every single time and appears to move completely randomly. 
Um, I tried bumping the search depth to three, and it went from taking about half a second to make a move to taking 10 seconds to make a move. So trying to go anything beyond three with the current AI code is probably not possible. Um, I didn't write the AI. Um, uh, someone else wrote it. There is actually a group at Caltech right now that I'm collaborating with to create a better AI for the game. But despite that, you agree probably that humans have even less chance against machine in a game like this, rather classical. At Maybe some point, statement? probably, yeah. At the moment, well, I, I think we can course. deal with probabilities that, I mean, if you write a good AI, maybe, I don't know. The, the, the non-deterministic side of things will probably affect it somehow. So we'll see, we'll see once Caltech comes through with their AI and see what happens. At the moment, like I said, the AI is stupid and you can beat it in, I think there's a six move combination that has a 75% chance of beating the AI every time. So um, how quantum is it? You have an underlying superposition. You have unitary movement. You don't have single cubic gates. You don't have arbitrary phase rotations and stuff like that. So it's not universal in, in quantum computing. But it does give you access to quantum phenomena in a meaningful way, I think. Um, there are quantum strategies that are evolving. So it does let the player physically, I mean, get, kind of get hands-on with superposition entanglement and interference too, though that's a little more difficult to strategize with because you can't see the phases. Um, so as a secondary purpose, it served its purpose as a proof of concept that you can actually make a board game of a pretty decent size and complexity based on a fully known quantum superposition and unitary movement and all of that. So you could conceivably from here take the next step and make a game that has phase rotations and measurement in different bases and stuff like that and get stuff like um, bell states and, and such, you know? So you, you could get more quantum, but I, I think it serves a, a good purpose of introducing anyone to quantum phenomena in a way that is accessible. Um, how effective is it? Again, still to be answered, but it's, it's caught on. Um, there, there's a pretty enthusiastic quantum chess community. Um, there are people that actually are playing the game and trying to figure out how, to, how it works and break it. Um, there's a number of different groups that seem to like it. Science and physics, obviously. Educators, obviously. Chess players, obviously. But the gaming community in general kind of caught on to it. I ran a Kickstarter for it to raise funds to help pay a development company to develop it further into an actual game that people might want to play. Um, and there were quite a lot of just general gaming community backers because it's something completely new. I mean, there's no other games that are, I mean, like this out there that actually run on superposition and unitary evolution and stuff. I mean, they're, they're coming, they're starting to be developed, but I don't think any yet are as complex as quantum chess anyway. Um, one of the backers, Elmar van Kordenort, has been very enthusiastic and actually quite helpful in the community. And he came up with a number of quantum chess puzzles. So I wanted to present a couple of them here. Um, so the first puzzle is you have this sequence of moves. Uh, first is the bishop does a quantum move from a1 to f6. Then the uh, pawn moves through it. And the question is, can the pawn on the black player's second move try and move into f6? Is that a legal move? So you have to consider the two different subspaces. In one of the subspaces, the pawn has already moved to f7. In the other subspace, the bishop is in the way. So it's not a legal move, so it's not going to allow the player to try to do that. The other question is, can the pawn try and move to f, 
or to f5. And if so, what is going to be the outcome? So if you again consider the two subspaces and consider the fact that the standard move is just a swap, on the subspace where the pawn hasn't moved, it will try and perform the swap, but the bishop is in the way. So it's not gonna do anything. On the subspace where it has moved, the swap is actually gonna move it backwards. So you end up with a pawn that is 100% in F7. Um, fun little puzzle that he came up with. The other puzzle is this one. Um, given these moves, the, the rook being coming from the same piece, what, which of white's pieces can try and attack the king? Anyone want to take a stab at that? So which pieces can attack the black king in the top right corner? So there are two knights, two white knights? There's, yeah, a knight that is in superposition in two positions, yeah. So you, ab you obviously have the rook that can attack it in the top left. The question, I guess, really is. It's very difficult. Yeah. So bottom left corner is your bishop. Is it possible for the bishop to try and attack the king? Is there any subspace where that's legal? Same, same rook. Same. So same rook, so every subspace, the rook is in the way, so the bishop can't attack. Is it possible for the queen to try and attack the king? Yeah? On one of the subspaces, the, the knight will be in the way, so it won't do anything, so it'll only get through with a 50% probability. Um, and then obviously the rook in the top left can attack it, and then one of the knights can attack it. The other one can't, even with a quantum move, because you can't attack with quantum moves. The future of quantum games. So here the point is with the queen, because you had an interesting configuration here that if checks were legal, then you would have a problem with position. Oh, yes. So if checks were legal, there would be a problem because on some space, some subspace, the uh, king would be in check. Right. And on right. some spaces, right. yeah. Right. So for, for a multitude of reasons, I decided that checks are not a legal move. Um, so as far as the future of quantum games, um, quantum checkers seems to be the next obvious step or maybe should have been the first step. <laughs> um, and even before that, maybe quantum tic-tac-toe. But uh, quantum chess seems to work out well, and I learned a lot doing it. And I feel like by doing quantum chess first, I was able to figure out a lot of the issues that other board games will face, um, even if they're not as complex, and be able to implement them better. So. Maybe quantum checkers comes next. Quantum tic-tac-toe with phase rotations and single qubit gates. The trick is gamifying it. How do you make a phase rotation fun? Um, but being a nine by nine, you could store the, the entire state very easily. Um, quantum chess two, some version of quantum chess that includes phase rotations and their measurement and arbitrary bases and stuff like that. What a phase rotation on the entire board would look like, I don't know. I mean, if you consider its current um, orientation, the Z orientation, and you want to rotate into the X basis, what does that even mean? I mean, so who knows? You're, you're dealing with essentially qubits here that are positions that have some, arbit some, some value associated with their piece, so I'm, I'm sure there's math out there that tells you how to rotate qubits from z to x and what that would look like on the board afterwards is, could be pretty interesting. Um, perhaps a quantum runner type game, if any of you are familiar with games like Temple Runner where your, your character essentially exists in one of three lanes and it's constantly moving and there's obstacles and you move back and forth to avoid the obstacles. Well, you could conceive of a game where your character it's essentially a beam splitter and now is in two different paths. 
and you're moving back and forth on both paths and things that affect your phase rotation could happen in those paths and then they reconverge and based on their phases, your character shoots off to the left or goes straight. Something like that could be fun. So a completely different type of game that might be more accessible to a different audience. Um, and I mean, I've got ideas for all kinds of other types of games too, but I, I think there's a future where quantum games are, are normal and fun and people play them and understand them even without understanding the underlying math and quantum mechanics. And I think that future could lead to maybe better quantum physicists. Um, if you have an intuitive understanding of what the equations should do and you make a mistake and you just look at it and go, well, that kind of looks wrong because I think it should do this. Who knows? Are you um, saying there is a scientific benefit for physicists here? I think so. I, I feel like I understand quantum mechanics better just by well, I'm not talking about the creating the game scientific. and making the game. Um, well, why do you think it's for a physicist would be easier to learn something new about quantum mechanics through this game rather than from quantum mechanics directly? So, what's, uh, why do so we if you're that? learning the equations of gravity for the first time and you know that balls don't fly up, and you make a mistake in your equations and that tells you that the ball is going to fly up, you're immediately going to look at that and go, that's wrong, and change it and figure out where you made the mistake. Instead of turning in the assignment and then the professor comes back and says, well, that's wrong, and now you have a harder time understanding why it's wrong. Might help some people. Might not be for everyone. Maybe some people will understand it better through equations, but I, for one, am a visual learner. If I can imagine myself in the situation, I understand it better. If you have an intuitive feel for what it means for something to be in superposition or entangled with stuff, and you can try and imagine yourself in a scenario where you're existing in two positions at once, maybe that'll help you with actually doing the science. There is a difference here because baseball game or any other game, it's actually you know, something happening instead of you here devising the rules. So it's quite different playing quantum chess versus observing atomic systems. You will learn something in the second one. I'm not sure about the first one. You, you know what I'm saying? I, I... Because you have rules, yes, you follow the, you know... The, yeah, I mean, but any... Chess, but just historical... Baseball access. has rules. No, just know, because the, the baseball has rules doesn't mean you don't learn how a ball is going to fly by throwing it a thousand times. What I'm saying is that the ball follows the gravity because that's the law of nature, right? But yeah. the rules of quantum chess are not necessarily the laws of nature. It's but it's unitary theory. evolution that leads to superposition and entanglement and stuff. That's true, but there is an additional human layer here added. When you baseball has an additional human layer added. If you play baseball for 10 years, you're going to get better at throwing a ball. You don't learn anything about the natural rule of gravity as far as the equations are concerned. But your brain does develop a better understanding of the arc that the ball is going to follow. Just because you're doing it. Just because you're interacting with that force. Here, you get to interact with superposition, with entanglement, with interference. You're, you're just doing it. So you're not going to get better at the equations of it, but you're going to gain a better fundamental intuitive understanding from, of it. Hopefully. That's my hope. Um, and if you have that better fundamental intuitive understanding, maybe that means you'll be better at doing the science. Maybe that means you'll be better at doing the math because you'll have a better grasp of okay, well, that looks wrong. Or maybe it'll mean, means you'll be better at coming up with breakthroughs because you have the more intuitive feel for it. Um, I mean, I feel like if you can imagine yourself in a situation, it's easier to see the next step. And I don't think equations can give you that imaginative, imaginative intuitive understanding. Maybe some people it can. But I, I think for some people, having a hands-on approach to feel the phenomena in, in some way might help. So, any other? Oh, you had asked about um, en passant. Right. That was a tricky one. Okay. 
Um, but you did mention after that, I've heard you said that you implemented yeah, it. It is implemented. Um, there are situations where it got really tricky because you could be performing en passant on a pawn that was in superposition because there was a knight in the way. And so, well, in some subspace, you're actually trying to capture the knight. In the other one, you're trying to capture the pawn through en passant. In both subspaces, your pawn actually was able to move diagonally into the, the capturing position. And so it removes um, both the knight and the pawn. But that, that was one of the trickier ones to, to implement. Um, actually, one of the slides shows castling through superposition. So you ended up with a king that's in superposition. And so you can castle to the other side as well on some subspace. <laughs> so you, you get some pretty interesting board positions. Um, one of the... Uh, Wait, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand. We're talking about on the white side castling, right? White side castle. But why did you... So, so which one is... OK, king is the, the second from the right, right? Yeah, so and king is... Rooks, yeah, you've got two rooks. Why don't you have a king on the black side, on the black spot, on E file? Why don't you have it? Because you castled the other way as well. But there is a knight there. There's a on knight B1. that is there in superposition. Where's so, the one? oh, there is on F. Yeah. Okay. So I'm actually, I didn't come up with this particular scenario. Again, Elmar came up with it by playing. Um, but you, you, you get a king that is in superposition and having castled two different ways, and it so just. Oh, yeah. Easy change to make right as we could. Though I'm wondering about your indistinguishable pieces thing. That might actually make original, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, that could be an interesting change. I, yeah. You would have to rotate the image for, for one or the other. Yeah, just rotate the blue ring. Mm -hmm. So. so, yeah, it's uh, one of the um, more powerful uses of the, the quantum aspects in this. I've, I've found to be having a bishop in superposition on two um, adjacent diagonals. The player has to deal with the fact that there's maybe a bishop along, say, the uh, a1 to h8 diagonal and the a3 to uh, f8 diagonal. So just that pressure on the player that they have to deal with and play around. I mean, even though technically there's, it's 50-50 chance, you're, as a player, you have to think around that and strategize through it. So um, another interesting thing is you can have pieces guarding themselves. So uh, you could do a quantum move of the knight one standard move away, and then if the player tries to capture on one, you can try and counterattack, and on 50-50 chance, you'll be successful and take their piece. Um, you can have kings that exist in a Schrodinger state, I like to call it. It's both alive and dead at the same time. Um, so it, you, you get some pretty interesting gameplay. You can do up to two moves, so you can do one move. And you did, um, and you did mention in the beginning that uh, some of the variants, I, I assume it's not this one, allow superposition of different types of pieces. So the piece could be both knight and, and, and bishop. So, and so you pieces. can generalize the no double occupancy rule into a, a k occupancy rule. So let's say you set k at three, um, oh, then you could have up to three types of pieces in, in a position before the game says, OK, collapse it back to at most three. 
or two or, two or five or put your bishop and knight together and they're entangled. Yeah, and then move, then you say it both ways, but if it collapses, only one is yeah, there. Choose one. That's yeah. I know. It's, yeah, it's, it's already hopeless, so <laughs> make it worse. I have a question just about this, this is the part of it that wants to just see if the game can take real nonsense. If I had a rook and four pieces, different pieces that were all half or 50% chance of being in their spaces, and I move my rook, the quantum move of my rook through all four of those pieces, does it half each time? And can the game handle that? It can handle it, um, depending on how the subspaces are aligned. That might not be a legal move if there is no possible subspace where moving a rook through those spaces is, right. is legal. Would I end up at the end with like a rook with one over and then yeah. if it got there um, maybe because there might be so you can have subspaces where let's say you've got a rook that's in superposition and it's trying to move through something and that other thing is in superposition too well they might be present on two completely or different subspaces and so the rook goes through with 100%. It's not halved because on that subspace where the rook moves, the other piece isn't in the way. So it depends on how the moves were done, um, how measurements have played out, what subspaces have been thrown away. Um, yeah, it's hard to say without seeing the moves that led to the board configuration you're talking about. Thank you. Okay, good question. Um, right now it is in closed alpha. Um, if anyone is interested, I do have some spare alpha keys. Email me, I can get you an alpha key. I am hoping to release the open beta at the end of next month. It will be available on the Steam store. Um, so, yeah. How close are we to the world championship? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I actually I got to play a game against Anna Rudolph. If any of you are familiar with her from the chess community, um, and we're actually tied right now. We need a tiebreaker. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's I don't know. It's it'd be cool to see it. Catch on. So you can see if you can have a check on if you want anymore. Maybe there's some, some detail I haven't thought of. You can, you can tell me if I'm wrong. But, um, the check rule can be that pieces in superposition can cause a check, but you can only cause a check if every king is threatened. If you do that, then I think that it would work. Because then the king is it free could to, work. to move away and yeah. itself out, and then it would be really hard to keep it in check in that way. You'd have to be able to threaten it in lots of different ways at once. Yeah. So I've discussed like something that, similar. That sort of happen automatically anyway, right? I mean, just the way the game works. Yeah. I mean, we've we've kind of discussed something a similar idea, and it definitely could work. It you could implement a check rule. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, will the slides be available? I can give them to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With one L. Okay. At usc.edu. Thank you. So, thank you. Justin and I were wondering, there are various ways you could think about when things should be measured, right? So, mm -hmm. one of the obvious ones is if, if if pieces are capturable, then they should be measured. Yes. Did you try that? As a Yes, I did. Um, I decided not to implement it that way because I thought it would be cool to have 
a piece that could be both alive and dead. Yeah, so right. And so, so if it's. This allows you to have these Schrodinger states. Yes. Um, right. So I, w I wanted it to. I, I wanted to try and preserve the superposition as much as possible and measure as little as possible. Right. And that's, so. That's, yeah, that's exactly what would yeah. happen. Yeah. So. Yeah, so if you're but on the other hand, you sort of need to have measurements often enough yeah. just to control the state. Right. And I've, I mean, in practice, this seems to work. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I actually was so worried about the superposition and the state space growing out of control that I kind of overdid it. And then it was hard to have superposition. Yeah. And so then I dialed it, back. Have to dial it back. So it's all yeah, kind yeah, of finding that line of yeah, yeah, because how you know, often should so measurements occur? Okay, what is the precise rule for what measurements happen and when? It's, it, it's very much an iterative process and finding a, a good balance yeah, between yeah, that makes sense. having enough superposition that people can actually experience it and keeping it under control. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is really cool. Very nice. It's been pretty interesting. Well, we should congratulate uh, Chris for his first talk, right? You said. Yeah. It was your full, yeah, first, first full size. First full size seminar, yeah. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. That's oh, man. Ever on, on any topic, so. I couldn't. Can you join me for dinner? No, I can't do that tonight. But thanks. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. It was a really great talk. Oh, thank I'm, you. I'm curious, you know, now that there's, it, it, it's in development and you know, going to be commercial on, on Steam and everything. I'm sure there's all, all sorts of issues of, uh, of co copyright and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering though if there's any, um, if, if you've written anything, if you've posted anything, just about the actual implementations that you've used, the, any of the code, code snippets. Anything? Not code yet. Um, no, that wasn't. The, yeah, um, you're right. There's there's copyright and all that issues. Um, all of that is being worked on. <laughs> At some point, I will have some code snippets and stuff like that. Um, I'm currently writing a paper on sort of the more math side of the implementation. Yeah. But um, yeah, I haven't posted any code yet. Uh, there are people who have been helping me work on the code, but they've all signed NDAs. It's guaranteed. guaranteed. The, the reason I ask oh, sure. is um, I'm uh, in a special, I don't know, sort of intersection of, um, of studies that is really fascinating with stuff like this. I'm doing music and physics. Okay. And actually one of my interests right now is looking at computer generated music, uh -huh. particularly um, with, I mean, uh, the, the idea of doing some sort of quantum algorithm for generative. Right, yeah. Generative music. Um, sounds really great. So I, I, just for the sake of inspiration, I would love to um, to, to see some of those technical sides, but of okay. course, remaining yeah. completely respectful of you know. Well, I mean, send me an email, and uh, if I can help you, I would be happy to. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Was it in your car? Okay. That's a good And besides, I have to be at seven. We won't be done by seven. So, yeah, this is really quite a great project. I, I had seen the movie that you guys made with oh, okay. Keanu, but uh, I, I didn't appreciate from that how much richness there was in the game. It seemed like you had implemented only kind of a few simple moves. From yeah, the video. I didn't it was. I realized that it was tracking a full Hubbard, Hubbard space this way. But yeah, I really, I really like it. I think this idea about having the matching rings in that last division would be really nice because the in the example you showed mm -hmm. you have the rook blocking yeah, the way. Yeah, they were opposite. It would be obvious the rook was blocking the way if it was like this. Yeah. And so that, that kind of thing would make it more visually clear what's going on. Yeah. Now the way the game works, if a move is going to fail automatically, does it tell you or do you lose the move? Uh, no, it won't even allow you to try to make the move. If it's going to fail. Okay, yes. So that's just a zero. Yeah. Um, so when you select a piece for a quantum move, it calculates all the possible moves it can make 
and highlights them. Oh, so it shows you what all your right. Yes. Okay, that's nice. And so you can't even click on a space that is not a possible move. Okay. So. so even though this, things like phase would make it not obvious when that's going to happen, the game just warn you kind of in advance. Yeah. Because in a sense, to really play this game effectively, you would kind of need to keep track of all those things in your head. Now, possible. there are moves you can do that won't have any visible effect. Yep. But they will have a phase effect. Right. That's exactly what I'm yes. saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so really if, if it lets you do the move, it did something. Yeah, yeah. But even if it doesn't change the probabilities at all, it you you rotate the phase. So like if you did say a quantum move of the night one standard move away. Um, the the subspace where you did move has a, a phase of I. Um, then you do a standard move up to one standard move away, it swaps the phases. And then you do the quantum move again, it's like your piece moved backwards because the phases got swapped during the standard move. But that standard move won't show any visible effect in the game because it's not changing the probabilities at all. I see. Now, um, it's going on. Yeah, um, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you. Oh. I have to run, unfortunately, since I have a meeting. I have to get to Okay, here. yeah. Um, so I won't join you for dinner. I would love to join you for dinner and just keep chatting. Yeah. Okay. We'll, well, thank you we'll very stay much. In contact. I'll yeah. Grab one of those alpha keys for Definitely, me. yeah. And, um, there's a lot of fun ideas we can yeah. bounce around. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. I'll Thanks. See you soon. So, um, so, yeah, we've got enough. Uh, if you just, just give me 30 seconds. I'm still mic'd up, I guess. <laughs> just uh, leave this here. Yeah, I think uh, I don't know what happens to the pamphlet for production. Yeah, uh, I think that means you can just take it stuff home, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think if we leave it here, they'll come back. Yeah, it's coming in right now. So, so uh, dinner preferences. You tell me. I will eat anything. Are we are we on foot? Are we driving?